Welcome to the Everything History Podcast for episode 21, The Execution of King Louis the Sixteenth. Today we'll be picking up right where we left off, which was on September 20th, 1792. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. Everything you hold worthwhile is in the we meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Alrighty, a lot has happened in 1792 so far. France is now at war with Austria, Prussia, and a variety of other Germanic kingdoms. A war which is now known as the War of the First Coalition. Revolutionary France has started the war off very poorly, losing every significant engagement until September 20th when they forced a decisive Prussian retreat at the Battle of Valmy. And internally much had happened too in 1792. Violence and insurrection broke out in late July and August. The monarchy headed by King Louis XVI was officially overthrown and the Legislative Assembly lost power as well. And what this meant is that the Constitution of 1791, meant to be the foundation of France as a constitutional monarchy, had been cast aside, violently. For thousands had died in Paris during August and early September. The governmental body that filled the void was the National Convention, which established the First French Republic on September 20th. Now that brings us fully up to date. So, France had just changed governments for the third time, depending, I suppose, on how you count. And this third time was a Republican Revolution. But quite frankly, France's establishment of a republic didn't mean anything if they couldn't put up a fight in the War of the First Coalition. But they had. They had won the Battle of Valmy, which in my opinion is the more important event of September 20th, because the creation of the French Republic would not have mattered had they lost that day. Yet they had won, and the Republic was founded. Officially, the National Convention had declared a republic on September 20th, but it actually took two more days to officially found the new government, because on the 21st they abolished the monarchy, and thereby the Constitution of 1791, and it was thus decided that the next day would be the dawn of the republic, an era of French prosperity. Yet, as I will soon tell you though, it was anything but prosperous, and certainly not peaceful. So allow me to go into some detail about the National Convention. The Convention was to be the ruling body of the new French Republic. In fact, it was to function as, effectively, France's executive body, legislative body, and as King Louis will find out, the highest court in the land. The body consisted of 750 members who had been rapidly elected in early September. The only people who weren't allowed to vote on the delegational elections were unemployed and those in servitude, but it is difficult, if not impossible, to say how many people had been really able to vote in the impromptu election. Significant representatives included the familiar names, Georges Danton, Maximilien Robespierre, Jean-Paul Marat, Jacques-Pierre Brousseau, Jérôme Pétion, and oddly enough, even Thomas Paine from the U.S. Although, in case you're wondering, Thomas Paine was effectively exiled from the United States at this point due to his radical political views, but that's neither here nor there. Now that the National Convention was in session at the very beginning of autumn 1792, they had many, many problems to deal with. There was a war, there was lawlessness, and there was the lack of military leadership, but most glaring of all, there was the French not-so-royal family. With the monarchy abolished, Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette were in a very unique and very precarious situation. At best, I suppose they could hope for being exiled and forgotten about by the French people, much like King James II of England after the English Revolution of 1688. Yet, if you are familiar with history, which I assume you are, then royalty typically does not have a great survival rate in their post-revolution nations. Eventually, it would be decided that King Louis needed to be put on trial, but there were other issues developing in the fall of 1792 that needed to be dealt with as well, primarily the war effort. I won't go into extensive detail because this is about the French Revolution, not the French Revolutionary Wars. However, I will go into some detail. After the victory in late September, the French turned to the offensive. They chased Prussian forces for two months until they were outside French territory, and in late October, the French allocated a large portion of their efforts to fighting the Austrians near the Austrian-Netherlands border. The Austrians were very quickly overrun, and France decided to press the advantage further. Their armies entered into the Netherlands and helped establish an independent Belgian state by the end of November. But what was the French strategy? 
Why were they doing this? Did the National Convention want to spread republicanism? Did they simply want to protect their own French Revolution? Or were they now conducting operations for the betterment of France alone? Well, that is a very hard question to answer, and really a whole book could be written on it, because the National Convention was very much divided on almost every issue. Yet if I had to give an answer to what the French war policy really was, I would say a little bit of all of the above. If you listen to the doctrine of the Girondists, then the war was about the expansion of quote-unquote freedom. But if you dig a little deeper, you will find that much of what France was doing was about trying to preserve its new republic and conducting all necessary measures to meet such a goal. But regardless of the convention's reasoning, by December the war was no longer an imminent threat to the French Republic or Paris at large. With that in mind, the National Convention and its various committees held complete control. But as I mentioned just a second ago, the convention was very divided. This divide came from within the Jacobin Club, which now controlled almost every seat and facet of French politics. The divide came between the Girondists and a new group that called itself La Montagne, or the Mountain. And I again emphasize that this was all within the Jacobin Club, and both wings of the club were radical, but the Mountain was extremely so. If there is a political faction that you remember from this French Revolution series aside from the expansive Jacobin Club itself, I beg that you remember The Mountain. That shouldn't be too hard to remember either because honestly, that's a pretty cool name. The Mountain was made up of the leading Jacobins and the leading radicals, especially those opposed to the Girondists. Notably men such as Robespierre, Danton, and Marat. The Mountain's creation is not something set in stone, but their rise certainly occurred after the creation of the Republic. So what was the divide truly about? What triggered the animosity between the Girondists and the Mountain? Well, that brings us back to the fate of King Louis XVI. The Girondists, led still largely by Brousseau, advocated for doing nothing with the king. They argued that it would be best to hold the royalty as hostages because anything more would provoke other European nations into action, and by leaving the king a simple citizen, France could focus on larger issues, like the ongoing war. This immediately brought forward opposition from the rising members of the mountain, otherwise known as La Montagnade. They asserted that letting Louis live or go without judgment would undermine the Republican Revolution and leave France susceptible to counter-revolutionary actions. Many advocated for execution, to which Thomas Paine famously responded, quote, Kill the king, but spare the man. And there is much wisdom in that statement, but most could not create or see the distinction between King Louis and Citizen Louis. But they did have to decide on a course of action, and so what were they to do? Well, I'll stop avoiding the question and just tell you the obvious. They decided to put Louis on trial, but it took until December for the National Convention to finally decide this. Many extremists were very upset about this, though, like one of the mountain's leaders, Robespierre, who said, quote, Louis cannot be judged, he is already judged. He has been condemned, or else the Republic is not blameless. To suggest putting Louis on trial, in whatever way, is a step back toward royal and constitutional despotism. It is a counter-revolutionary idea because it puts the revolution itself in the dock. After all, if Louis can still be put on trial, Louis can be acquitted. He might be innocent, or rather, he is presumed to be until he is found guilty. But if Louis is acquitted, if Louis can be presumed innocent, what becomes of the revolution? End quote. That was a strong point that made a lot of sense to a lot of Parisians. But by the way, don't give Robespierre too much credit for that idea. He simply ripped that off other radicals and championed it as his own, which of course is politics 101, I suppose. Yet the trial was to happen despite how popular it would have been to simply murder Louis without the trial. Thus, the trial began on December 11th, 1792. His prosecutors were to be the leading members of the convention, and his jury, the entire national convention. For the first days of Louis's trial, the convention immediately made it clear that the judicial process was to end in either execution by guillotine or Louis's freedom. Other options were available, but it was clear that such options would garner no large-scale support. The delegates then assailed Louis with charges. They accused him of basically everything, including, but not limited to, the economic depression, the annual food shortage, and the general desecration of the people's liberty. 
all of which were very vague. Many of the charges were very far-fetched, but others were fairly well-founded, actually. The National Convention now had full access to Louis and Marie Antoinette's letters, and these proved to be the most damning of all evidence. They thoroughly proved that Louis was not a friend of the Revolution in any of its forms, and he had definitely been hostile to a Republican form of government. Yet, did such an idea, such an opinion, really mean your death? If it does, that doesn't really sound like freedom. But let's be real, this trial and the new Republic of France was not about freedom, it was about dominance, and the convention clearly felt that they could not dominate with Louis alive. And to be even more honest still, many delegates simply wanted the royals dead out of pure hatred. You can read this in their letters and correspondence. And one thing all evidence showed was that Louis had clearly lied in the past about his support for the revolution, which to the National Convention was a most damning offense. The proceedings continued for two more weeks, with the king defending himself in front of 750 delegates, but Louis was rapidly granted a defense counsel. Louis XVI's official argument was that he was not guilty because, as William Doyle says, quote, he was a victim of circumstances rather than a resolute tyrant, a monarch who had given his people all that they had asked for, including liberty itself, end quote. Yet when the vote came, everyone knew what was going to happen. The trial had been just a formality, just as Robespierre had said. Louis was going to die. And the vote came on January 16th, 1793. 288 voted against death, 72 voted for execution on delay, and 361 voted for immediate execution. Louis and his defense appealed the decision immediately, and the National Convention carried out the final vote a few days later. 310 against, 380 in favor. So it was that in the Place de la Concorde, on January 21st, 1793, Louis XVI, no longer a king, was executed for all to see. Yet it wasn't just Parisians watching, and it wasn't just Frenchmen watching, the Western world had been awaiting the decision. The Republican radicals of France would soon find that the execution of Louis caused far more problems than it solved. So the king is dead. Now what? Well, a whole lot was about to rapidly unfold in the next few months. And the best way to explain what's coming next begins with some analysis. As you might have noticed, almost all of the recent events of the French Revolution, really the last three years, have been occurring within Paris. One could easily make the point that much of the French Revolution thus far had been a Paris Revolution. The vast majority of the action had occurred in the capital, and almost all leading politicians came from Paris. But who was really suffering through all this anarchy without any real say? The provincials. They had lost their king, their priests, and now there was a war. And they hadn't even had a say in the matter, really. Yes, they had representatives for now, but the Parisians had controlled the elections and controlled the laws. So the peasants and the people of the provinces felt that this revolution only benefited the urban bourgeois, and as the situation worsened, so too did the province's willingness to participate in the so-called republic. And I bring this up to sort of preface the upcoming revolt that occurs throughout the French provinces. Now, Louis's death had ruffled quite a lot of feathers in France, but Frenchmen throughout the nation were also greatly displeased by the economic situation. French currency was in an abysmal state, barely having even a shadow of its former value and credibility. Actual coinage had almost ceased to exist, having become effectively demonetized for a whole slew of complicated monetary reasons. Furthermore, the war effort was burning through money and, perhaps more importantly, supplies. France's economy was barely staying afloat, and on top of all this, it was that time of year again, winter, which meant more food shortages. This time around, though, there were very few granaries left, so people turned to the National Convention, and in early February, Parisians began to bombard the delegation and its various committees with petitions demanding that maximum prices be set on a variety of goods, not just grain, but other simple products as well. And they demanded this for two reasons. Number one, their money was constantly being undercut, forcing them to buy less. And two, they recalled that the Legislative Assembly had set a max price on grain the previous year. So why not expand such an idea to help the people? Well, economically, setting across the board prices like that is an awful idea, because while it helps people temporarily, it hampers the economy and the people in the long run. The delegates to the National Convention knew this, and even the radicals of the mountain refused to acknowledge, so far, the petitions. This dismissal, though, did not go over well in Paris. On the 25th of February, the Parisians reacted with, you guessed it, violence. 
Violence was now an official theme of the French Revolution by early 1793, a theme that was going to become even more emphasized before the year was out. The 25th of February didn't start out entirely violent, though. Hundreds of citizens, protected by thousands of their fellow Parisians, seized the markets and the shops. In some districts, the mob simply sold goods at the petition for rates, but other districts turned into mayhem. Warehouses were pillaged, shopkeepers were lynched, and by the time the National Guard established control the next day, hundreds had already been injured or killed. The National Convention was greatly troubled by the February outburst of unrest and violence, and the floor of the convention turned rapidly into a screaming match between the Girondists and the Montagnards. Both sides blamed each other for the unrest in Paris. The Girondists blamed the activities on Jean-Paul Marat, who they said instigated the violence with his constant talk of massacring the quote-unquote impure. And likewise, the Montagnards accused the Girondists, but in reality, there was no culprit or conspiracy to be found. But there was far more tension between those of the Gironde and the Mountain than just the food shortage and the subsequent riots. They disagreed over the role of the provinces, disagreed about economic policy, and of course, the war. And the question was, how to deal with the expanded war? Yes, you heard right, the war had now expanded by late February 1793. Spain and Portugal had declared war on France in January, and after the execution of Louis, Britain had pulled their ambassador. This defensive action by Britain was coupled with the knowledge that the British were mobilizing their navy and armies for war. And in early February, the British Parliament also declared that if France entered Holland, otherwise known as the Dutch Republic, then war would thereby be declared. The National Convention responded almost immediately by declaring war on Britain and the Dutch Republic. So France now had four more nations pitted against them. Spain and Portugal had lost much of their previous power, but they were still a very large threat combined. And if Britain truly committed to the fight, then France was in for one heck of a fight. The first major problem that came up relating to this war expansion was France's complete lack of manpower. The German and Belgian fronts had the necessary soldiers, but their contracts were coming to a close. So many soldiers were preparing to go home, and if anybody tried to stop them, they would likely just mutiny or simply desert their posts. Furthermore, the National Convention ordered the French commander General Dumaris to invade Holland. And to counteract this manpower crisis, the convention decreed on February 24th the need for 300,000 men. Now that number was ridiculous for a nation of 25 to 26 million people, and the decree asked for all volunteers, but stated that conscriptions would be used if necessary. Meaning a military draft would be used, and it would be necessary. This decision did not go over well at all because the National Convention had greatly overestimated the scope of their Parisian Revolution. Just as I discussed earlier, the provinces did not approve of almost anything that occurred in Paris. The provinces largely disagreed with the execution of Louis, the expulsion of the Catholic Church, and almost every single policy proposed and enacted by the radicals in Paris. And finally, the decree demanding 300,000 able-bodied men for the war blew the lid off the scarcely held peace in the provinces. The provinces ignited into rebellion, but the rebellion wasn't some sort of unanimous sort of civil war. It was just simultaneous bursts of revolt in western France, pockets of the north, eastern France, and all along the southern coast of France. Nevertheless, despite this lack of unity in the rebellions, the rebellions were very potent and the politicians in Paris were extremely frightened. Throughout several provinces, peasants took up arms and forcibly removed the bourgeois officials in town centers, and they did so because they despised the fact that the well-off Parisian delegates were demanding that their men be sent off to a war that none of them even cared to fight. Evidence of this is substantial, with some provinces amassing as many as 10,000 to resist their, quote, young men being taken off to fight distant enemies with whom they had no quarrel by authorities with whom their quarrel was limitless. End quote. That quotation was from William Doyle, and he continued saying, quote, Who were these self-styled patriots forcing others to fight their battles? And by March, thousands of Frenchmen and women were up in arms to resist the overbearing demands of their largely undesired republic. This should have been the National Convention's foremost concern, you know, stopping a civil war, but the Continental War took a turn for the worst in early spring. This turn began when General Dumaris was ordered to invade Holland with the bulk of his army. You see, the French had an air of invincibility, 
And this invincibility complex had grown thanks to the leadership of Dumouriez since early autumn 1792. However, the French military fortune was at an end. The invasion of Holland was strongly contested by the Dutch, with the French gaining very little, and the Austrians then pounced on the French rear armies in Belgium. With Dumouriez outflanked, the French ranks collapsed in Belgium, and when word arrived in Paris of the Austrian counterattack, the streets were again swept into a conspiratorial panic. Danton pushed for more soldiers to be sent to the Belgian front, but the situation was entirely muddled because news was arriving so slowly. The National Convention then began to suspect General Dumouriez of treachery. And they suspected this for two reasons. Number one, it was heard that he didn't support the idea of a republic. And two, reports were slowly trickling in that Dumouriez was intentionally leaving his forces susceptible to attack. And it turns out that they were actually right because General Dumouriez defected to the Austrians on April 6th. And perhaps his timing was telling because the already dismal political environment of Paris deteriorated even further along with the military, economic, and civil situations. In early March, the divide was widened even further between the Girondists and the Montagnards. And not at all in favor of the Girondists. The people of Paris, who seemed to collectively be the most radical community in the Western world, now strongly supported Robespierre and the Montagnards over Brousseau and the Girondists. And this is important because the mountain was supported by the people when in March they removed all Girondists from the Jacobin Club. This officially meant that the Jacobins were now run by the mountain, soon to be the most radical political group yet seen in Europe. Moreover, this largely stripped the Girondists of what status they had left. The Girondists would survive for some time longer, but their exile from the Jacobin club marked their rapid downfall at the hands of the mountain. With the mountain at the lead by mid-March, the National Convention acted in the face of their massive crisis by deciding to streamline their government. They set up a surveillance committee to track suspect individuals, the Committee of General Defense, and the Committee of Public Safety. The most important of those was the Committee of Public Safety, which was led by nine delegates and would soon wield incredible power. But the Montagnards did not stop there. They created the infamous Revolutionary Tribunal in order to expedite judicial cases. These entities would within months supersede the National Convention itself and it would be under the auspices of Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety that the Reign of Terror would be unleashed. And that concludes episode 21. If you liked what you heard, make sure to subscribe and review on iTunes. Questions and corrections can be directed to everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thank you very much.